Good day and welcome to today's DBI update on COVID-19. We have with us, as usual, Honorable Minister of Health, Dr. Frank Anthony. Welcome, Dr. Anthony. And, well, thank uh, you very much for having me on the program. Thank you. One of the initial aims of government's uh, overall COVID-19 campaign was to slow the spread of the pandemic in Guyana. Uh, can you comment on some of the success stories so far in the campaign? Well, I think there are a number of success stories uh, because when we look at spread of the virus in, the, in different regions of Guyana, we have seen that in some cases there were spikes and then we were able to control it. And that speaks to the kind of public health measures that we have put in place. A good example would have been uh, Region 9. At one time we had uh, close to 100 and something active cases. And right now we have reduced that to about six active cases. And you would see those variabilities in different regions. So at times there are little spikes. And then once all the public health measures uh, are put in place, uh, you would see a slowing uh, of transmission. Uh, so while the, ni the national average uh, would be going up, when you disaggregate it by different regions, you would see that uh, regions, uh, quite a few regions are doing very well. One of, on, on that note of the success in, in Region 9, Region 1 has recently, at least in some areas, has seen uh, some spikes. Yeah. You have covered, you have talked about it recently. Do you see the same measures being applied there as well? And um, because it's changing so rapidly, in light of your recent comments, how are things progressing here right now in light of health officials visiting the area and working with local officials as well? Well, in fact, once we uh, saw that there were cases, active cases in Quibana, which is one of the most affected areas in Region 9, we took those measures. Uh, we sent in a health response team to bolster the health team that was on site. Uh, we had a lot of discussions with the Tushao and uh, other persons in the council, uh, working with them so that they can help the community to better adhere to the measures. Uh, so apart from public health measures and education, the health team also uh, responded by uh, taking in uh, test kits swabbing people, sending that out uh, to the National Public Health Reference Lab so that we are able to understand how many people have been affected. And that's the reason why you would have seen a spike because of the testing that we have done. Once we know that somebody is positive, uh, we, we isolate that person. Um, we have been able to isolate most of them in their own homes and we have uh, explained to the persons who are living with them what precautions they need to take. In some cases, we have been able to provide them uh, with some amount of uh, PPEs and other things that are necessary when you are in, um, you know, in these types of environment. In addition to that, uh, there's restriction of movement in and out of the community so as to prevent uh, persons from other communities coming in and perhaps getting exposed to the virus. So once you put those measures in place, um, within two weeks to three weeks, you would see the number of cases going down because we have had similar experiences with other villages and we know this, uh, these methods that we are using have really worked and worked very well. So we are employing those same techniques uh, in Quibana and some of the other affected areas. Coming back to the countrywide picture as we started earlier in terms of the success stories, generally speaking, what have been some of the challenges? Because uh, it has been widely reported since the new government took office, there has been, you took over a situation that was really uh, nothing to talk about. What have been some of your challenges uh, along the way, in light of the accomplishments as well? Well, the challenges have been uh, numerous uh, because if you think about how you manage the, uh, the disease, you first have to know uh, how much of the um, persons are infected. And to know that, you have to do testing. So our capacity to test was severely limited. 
Uh, we have changed that dynamic because we have now been able to equip the National Public Health Reference Lab um, with enough capacity, meaning equipment to do PCR testing. We have three PCR machines there. Uh, we have extractors, so the process is no longer manual, but it's an automated process. Uh, in addition to that, we have been able to procure enough test kits and reagents uh, so that we have um, adequate uh, stocks to ensure that as we ramp up testing, we are able to do that. So testing is a very, very important component in any response. Once we know um, where we have sick people or persons who have tested positive, then we can move to the next stage. And that is, um, if they are positive, then we have to take precautions. So we have to isolate people. We have prepared in every region of this country uh, institutional isolation centers. So those persons who cannot be isolated at home uh, can come to one of our centers or we can put them in those centers if uh, they're not complying at home. And of course, we have allowed for home isolation as well. So these are positive people who, if they clinically, uh, they have mild forms of the disease, then we are able to isolate them either at home or in one of these facilities. If, however, they have um, signs that they're having respiratory difficulty, then that's one of the typical signs that you need to look at to hospitalize people. And here again, um, we have been able to secure hospital beds, adequate amount of hospital beds. So in case anyone need hospitalization, we can put them on one of these beds. Then you can have uh, maybe different categories of bed, right? So somebody might come in there with moderate form of the disease might not require too much ventilatory support. So uh, they will be on the bed, they would be seen by a doctor regularly and treated. But if they require ventilatory support, then uh, you would have to get a ventilator or a CPAP machine or one of those other types of equipment that would assist the person in breathing properly and receiving oxygen. And so in most of our regional hospital, we did not have this capability. And over the last uh, couple of weeks, we have worked really hard to ensure that we have this capability at our regional hospital. Um, we have bought and bring into the country a number of ventilators. And we have uh, on order some CPAP machines. We have a number in the country, but we want to expand that so that the capacity at the region would be improved significantly. And anybody who um, come into the hospital with severe uh, or critical COVID uh, would be able to receive that care. In addition to that, um, we inherited a, you know, a system where there was extreme shortages of medication. And we have been working through emergency procurement of medication to ensure that all the regional hospitals and facilities treating COVID would have medication. Now, there's no magic medication for COVID, uh, but what we do need is to have medication that can assist with other signs and symptoms that people are experiencing. And so we have been able to provide them with that. PPE was another major challenge. Um, people were complaining they weren't having enough uh, PPEs and we are constantly working to uh, bring in PPEs, make sure that we have adequate stock and make sure that we are getting it distributed to all our regional hospitals. The complaints have been reduced. I know here and there there would be uh, complaints, but uh, in terms of the national system where we are acquiring enough, getting it into the system and then distributing it out to the region, I don't think anybody can complain about that. There might be some difficulty, I anticipate, from regional uh, storage to perhaps hospitals and so forth or health centers. But as we get these complaints, we work to remedy them. Uh, so it's an ongoing process. Um, and as I said, uh, we have a number of challenges, but every one of the challenges that we encounter, we have worked to ensure that we develop solutions to them and work to ensure that we do so very quickly. Uh, so the system and um, what we're doing 
I would say has much improved uh, from since we took it over. So we have improved testing, turnaround time, improved treatment, improved hospital capacity, expanded ICU. Uh, looking at diagnostics, we have expanded that as well. So in terms of care, uh, a number of things have happened. We have also recognized that people, um, because of the curfew and, and because of the pandemic, a number of persons have lost jobs. So we have looked at the socioeconomic side as well. And on the socioeconomic side, uh, that's why the government has come up uh, to give uh, $25,000 to each household. Um, before that, we were also distributing hampers to really needy families, and those hampers are going to be continued to di distribute by CDC, uh, as well as this $25,000 per household. So, you know, we are looking at a, a more comprehensive plan, and um, it's not just about putting in medical treatment for patients, but also uh, making sure that we can help to alleviate some of the socioeconomic problems that people are encountering. Uh, we have also uh, have a massive campaign that is ongoing called Kobe Curve, and that is intended to get more compliance with the public health preventative measures that we have put in place. Those measures include wearing masks, uh, sanitization, um, you know, keeping your social distance. These are all important things, but I guess because they're so simple, people tend to believe that they're not effective. But we have seen in, in places where they have been validated uh, testing of these uh, measures uh, that, for instance, uh, in a state in the U.S. where they start wearing masks, they have seen over a two-week period an 8 to 5 percent drop in transmission. So that's a significant thing, and um, that's one of the reasons why we have been emphasizing mask wearing because it's a really effective public health measure in terms of reducing spread. You know, when you go back, uh, these things are simple to, to understand. If somebody is sick and they speak, you will get droplets coming out of their mouth. You will get aerosols coming out of their mouth. These droplets or aerosols would have the virus. And if you don't have any physical guard in front of your mouth or nose, you can easily breathe it in or you can easily take it in through your mouth. Once that happens, the virus then starts multiplying in your throat and the upper part of your neck, you know, inside. Uh, so the trachea and then into the uh, respiratory system there. And that's how people get sick. So the best way of preventing that is to ensure that you have a mask. And that mask forms a physical barrier in terms of preventing these droplets from infecting you. Now, if everybody is wearing a mask, so imagine somebody who is infected is also wearing that mask. When they talk, they talk into the mask, and so those viral particles don't get very far. They are trapped within the mask. So there are, we know there are a number of people who are pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic, and if they wear a mask, they are also protecting others. So. This thing is, if everybody wears a mask, uh, we protect each other. And that's why it's important that we encourage people to wear masks. Uh, but as you know, this is an ongoing effort, and we really want uh, people to comply, because unless we are able to get a vaccine, um, you know, we are going to be in this for a while. So we need to understand the dynamics of the disease, uh, and take the precautionary measures. We'll come back to that vaccine uh, issue in a bit, but um, clearly your campaign has intensified and has been adjusted along the way to meet existing challenges or changing challenges, and your facility or your capacity has also improved. How are your frontline workers coping? Barring a few days of protests, as we know, and engagement now the government has begun, um, how are they coping and what, what message do you have for them? I think the frontline workers have been doing a, a very good job. Um, not only a good job, but they have really been the, at the front lines uh, between this virus and uh, protecting the population as a whole. 
So that's why they're referred to as frontline workers. They're right in front there, being that, um, that line, so to speak, between the virus and the rest of the public. Uh, when you look at um, our numbers, uh, we, we are not doing too badly. Uh, we would all want it to go down very quickly. But I think because of the efforts of our frontline workers, because of the care that they have been given, uh, to people, we have been able to make that difference. Um, and so I want to commend them for the efforts that they have put in place. And I want to um, also say that I'm sure they would continue to work because uh, health workers generally, when they come to this profession, it is about what, uh, you know, they want to help people to improve their health. Uh, they want people to they want people to, um, you know, to have a healthy life, and and this is where this is what they were trained for, and the the efforts that we are seeing now, it's giving of themselves, um, sacrificing and making sure that the general public uh, is doing well. So I really want to commend them because they have done a terrific job, and um, I'm sure they will continue to do their utmost best. Uh, we, are, of course, uh, would have to ensure that they, are, they remain safe because if frontline workers get sick, then they cannot provide the care uh, to the general public. So one way of preventing them from getting sick is to ensure they have adequate supplies of PPEs, ensure that they too are complying with how to use PPEs. Because you know when you're in this and after doing it for so many months, uh, you tend to become complacent. So you have to constantly uh, be reminded uh, to put on the mask, do the right things, don't take any shortcuts. And so we have been doing training, we have been doing retraining on how to use PPEs, how to put them on, how to take them off, uh, because we want to protect our frontline workers. And in, in addition to training in, in terms of PPEs, we have also been uh, doing training uh, clinical training, training on the use of ventilators, training in, the, in giving psychosocial support, uh, training in detecting patients who might have um, problems, mental problems and so forth, and how do you um, first of all be able to detect those patients and then work with them uh, to assist them to create better coping me mechanisms as they deal with COVID-19. Uh, they are the frontline workers. A lot of time have to deal with uh, with families who are, um, you know, coming. They want to know what's happening with their loved ones. So all these things, you know, it's a new environment. Um, we are doing it at scale, and um, in some cases, this is a, there's a lot of new uh, experiences for people. And so frontline workers have to cope with all of this. And it's our job to ensure that they're properly trained uh, to be able to perform at their utmost best. In closing, because our time is almost up, but uh, you did mention some time ago that um, frontline workers will be among those to be first, uh, will be among the first to receive the vaccines whenever the vaccines can get to Guyana. Interestingly, in the world right now, there is talk about a second wave in many countries. But uh, on the other hand, the expectation that a vaccine will soon be approved and after all those trials. How is Guyana preparing and what would be Guyana's plan for implementation of such a vaccine? Well, one of the major facilities that we have engaged is what is called COVAX facility. And through that facility, there are nine vaccines that are what you might call candidate vaccines. So these have shown uh, the most promise, and um, uh, they expect that a few of them, that they would be able to start manufacturing uh, either later in this year or early next year. Uh, through COVAX, uh, there's also a kind of a, a sub uh, part of COVAX uh, that is called COVAX AMC 92 because the COVAX AMC 92 is where uh, Gavi is going to assist these 92 countries in receiving vaccines at a, at a lower cost. So these 92 countries do not have to pay uh, the full amount for those vaccines. 
and Guyana is one of those 92 countries, so we'll benefit from that. But because of the amount of vaccines that would be needed in the world, it is anticipated that they would not have all the dosages ready um, on the first rollout when that vaccine is available. So the COVAX facility is looking at probably about 2 billion doses um, in its first round. And even with 2 billion doses, they would not be able to give every country their full quota of vaccines. So what they have said, once an effective vaccine and a safe vaccine is available, every country would receive vaccines to about 3% of their population in that first round. And that 3% they are advising because they have international bodies uh, that are looking at the, the global governance of the allocation of vaccines. And they're advising that among the first set of people to get these vaccines should be the frontline health workers. And so we, once we receive those vaccines, we would want to offer that to our frontline health workers. Of course, you can't force anybody to take a vaccine. And um, we, we are sure that most of our frontline health workers would want to have the vaccine to be protected. But I'm, I'm sure there might be one or two uh, persons who might not want to have a vaccine. Um, but the first set of people, uh, that 3%, we want to ensure that those persons who are on the front line, these health workers, there are other categories of people who interact daily uh, with the public, that they are the ones who must get the vaccine uh, on the first round. Then after that, um, the second round, they are going to give another 17% vaccine once they have enough dose. And then for those persons, um, they are advising that we should look at the elderly because they are most at risk and of course persons with comorbidities because we know that persons with other underlying illnesses such as heart disease or hypertension or cancer or immunocompromising diseases, respiratory disease, kidney disease, all these uh, categories of persons with underlying disease would be at higher risk of getting uh, COVID-19. So you want to protect them. And so in that second round, we want to offer this vaccine to those persons who might be uh, at that higher risk. And then after that second round, um, they're hoping by then the manufacturing capacity would be ramped up. And so you'll be able to get more dosages uh, for a third round. So we are working on this. Um, and as you would know, uh, we are sparing no efforts in trying to acquire a vaccine uh, because we feel that the vaccine is going to be uh, the only way out of this pandemic. And the reason why also we have to do it on a global scale, because if you protect one country fully and then you leave others, uh, the disease would spread back from those countries back into, you know, um, so we, we have to ensure that every single country would be able to get uh, vaccines. And by doing that, you'll develop population immunity, which is called herd immunity, and prevent the spread of uh, the virus, or you'll contain the spread of the virus. Uh, so th these are things that uh, we're working on, but they're still some months away. And while we await, uh, the outcome of the, the clinical trials and the manufacturing of these uh, vaccines and so forth, we have to take the precautions. That's the only way that we can protect ourselves now. And those precautions entail that we have to do those simple things. Keep your distance, uh, wash your hands uh, for 20 seconds and wear a mask. Those are the simple things that you can do. And if everybody do them and do them well, then we'll stay protected. Minister, let me thank you for your time on today's DPI update regarding COVID-19. And to, in closing, remind our listeners that they were listening to Honorable Minister of Health, Dr. Frank Anthony. And I wish to thank you for joining uh, on today's DPI update, uh, October 22nd, 2010. Thank you very much.